Today we're talking about what it means to be a great church in the sense that we make God look great to the world around us by enabling our children to become Christians. That is our topic today and it's part of our great series, God-focused, relationship-based, enabling our children to become Christians, always free yet spiritual and toiling to build the church well. So this marks our halfway spot through that series and of course this although it's about children becoming Christians this I want to make clear at the beginning is not about a a lesson just for parents and it is not specifically a parenting lesson and that's because we're talking about the church the community our if you like local village because it does take that village to raise the child so we're not, so don't count yourself out just because you're younger or older or a parent or not a parent or your parent of your children have long left home like mine and hallelujah, say not some of us. Um, nonetheless, um, however old they are and wherever you are in this parenting journey or connection with children, this is a lesson for you as much as anybody here today. So bear that in mind as we look through quite a few scriptures here today to get a broad, I hope, picture of what this means. By the way, I know Esther has the remote. Could I have that off you for a moment? Thank you. Yes, I'll need that. Thanks very much. So, uh, and also I have on the Watford Word put down all the scriptures I'll be using today so you can go back to them later if you want. Now, what am I also not doing? I'm not presenting a parenting class. I'm not presenting a formula. There is no such thing. The Bible ain't got a formula about how children become Christians uh, at whatever age. It is also clear that many of us have tried to help our children become Christians and so far found it to be a bit of a challenge. And it's not yet happened. Some of us with children who are older now, like myself, one of my children has never embraced the Christian faith. Another, my daughter did, and then decided to put to, to leave it. Um, that's not an uncommon experience here. So I'm also not standing here to say I've got the right formula and I know how it's done. Just do what I say; everything will be fine. <laughs> that's far from where uh, I am here. And indeed, in our congregation in Watford, you know, you, you we have a uh, I don't know about West Watford so much, but certainly our congregations we don't have that down pat, do we? So we need to uh, bear that in mind. Now, a couple of other thoughts to put in our minds before we get into the scriptures. The first thing is this, and again, I can't speak for West Watford so much, but in our culture, generally speaking, there has been over the years a sense of if someone says they've done a great job with their children, generally what that means is it's code for they've helped their children to become Christians as teenagers while they were still living at home. And there has been a sense of that value, that if someone's helped their children to become Christians while they're teenagers and still living at home, that equates to being a great parent. The problem is that's not in the Bible. And it's not either demonstrated nor taught. And it makes a lot of people feel undervalued, devalued, and uh, in a sense cursed by a standard, uh, a a made-up standard that church people have sometimes uh, uh, constructed. And I think we need to put that on one side. Being a good parent is not about producing an outcome in terms of children making a decision about something. We are not in control of those decisions, and we'll talk more about that just in just a minute. However, there is an opposite and perhaps equal negative reaction to that, which is also not helpful, which is this, which is to say, because I don't want to pressurize my children into having to make a decision and feel like they have to become a Christian, I will back off from the spiritual parts of their lives. And that passivity is just as bad as any kind of coercion into making a decision. So uh, we don't want to be passive, we don't want to be uninvolved, uh, and indeed that's often a lack of faith and courage when we are. Uh, sometimes there are difficult decisions to be made and we must make them. So what I would like to say at this outset is there is no place in this topic for despair, because God is in this, but there's also no place for complacency. And I pray and hope as we go along that we'll see from the scriptures what we can do in terms of having hope and faith, not having despair, but also knowing what kind of involvement is helpful so that we don't become complacent in this area. So let's have a look at a few scriptures. First of all, we've got to talk about God, haven't we? It's not all about the parents and the children. It's really, in the end, about God. 
So first of all, God has a vision that there will be lots of families of people who love him and follow him. What did he tell Adam and Eve? What did he create them to do? He gave the instruction to uh, be fruitful and increase in number. How are they going to do that? They're going to have lots of children. Well, at least some children. I don't know how many. Some of us have a lot of children. Uh, but all, any of us who are families here, we have at least one. And that's the idea that God wanted people to have children. And of course, that would be within families. And we see that all through the Old Testament. God wants families. That's an, and he wants them, of course, to be united in love for him. That's clear through the whole of Scripture. We don't have to, I think, prove that particularly. And God has compassion. God understands what children are like. Deuteronomy. The little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children, who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land. I'll give it to them. They'll take possession of it. So that's when they, they will be going into the promised land. And God says, these, these young ones, when they, uh, that now don't know right from wrong, they're going to be the ones to go into the promised land. So God is here acknowledging that children don't know right from wrong. Innately, they don't know. They, that's God's compassion saying they need help from you. For children to understand right and wrong, both in terms of a relationship with God and in general how to live, they need instruction, they need families, they need parents, and they need aunts and uncles and the extended family as well, which we will talk about. And so the key passage that uh, Timmy read so well, thank you, uh, which we're not going to read all again just here, but the key passage here shows us that it is the responsibility of adults to share what is meaningful about the faith in God. As it says uh, in that passage, uh, God, uh, your, these are the commands that you are to uh, teach and observe so that you and your children and the children after them may fear God and receive the blessings that God has, has, is going to give them. And the way to do that is to talk about God a lot. Every opportunity you get that's, that's relevant, talk about God. To, these commands are to be on your hearts impress them on your children that's not just saying here's a bible reader if you want to that's not just saying well let's pray if you want to impress these things on your children now we're talking about children not about young adults so much here i think but we are still talking about uh young ones talk about these things when you sit at home when you walk along the road when you lie down when you get up it, this is meant to be a culture in your family so a, a Christian family, if you have a Christian family, is meant to be a Christian culture. A church community is meant to be a, a Christian culture. We want to bring our children up within that kind of culture where we talk about God. God provides what is needed by giving adults to the children to guide them. Now, Proverbs. Instruction matters. I'm not going to detail, go into detail with the Proverbs, but I'm just going to give an overall picture. These are some representative uh, Proverbs about children and discipline. Whoever spares the rod hates their child, their children. But the one who loves their children, careful to discipline them. Chapter 15. A fool spurns his parents' discipline, but whoever heeds correction shows prudence. And chapter 22. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. Chapter 23, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with the rod, they will not die. Punish them with the rod and save them from death. Chapter 29, a rod and a reprimand impart wisdom. But a child left undisciplined disgraces its mother. Now, let's talk about what this might mean for a minute. Because there are a lot of different ways to interpret these proverbs. So the first thing I need to say is, proverbs are proverbs. In other words, they are, they are pithy sayings that sum things up. They're not instructions. They're warnings, they're guidance, they are also blessings. But a proverb is not a command as such. Now there are commands implied within it. But what I mean by that is, when it says, uh, don't, uh, don't hold the rod from your child, that doesn't mean that you have to spank them, or that you have to hit them with a literal rod. It's not saying you must do that. It's using that Im image that would be a common idea to say discipline is what matters. Discipline always hurts, but it doesn't have to hurt in that sense. I'm not making a statement here about whether I think 
physical disciplining of children is righteous or unrighteous, or right or wrong, or exactly biblical or not biblical. I, I don't think it's helpful to get into that right now here, because the key point is that discipline matters. And it is up to the adults in a child's life to offer that discipline. And it is clear that that discipline is usually not pleasant at the time, as indeed the New Testament says to us adults that God's discipline is not pleasant at the time, but it later produces a harvest of righteousness. So it's actually the same rule for children as for adults here. Adults need discipline as much as children. It's just that the children don't yet have the character formed to be able to apply self-discipline. An adult is expected to apply self-discipline. A child needs an adult to help them form the character that will enable them to then uh, uh, exercise self-discipline later on in life. And that is the responsibility of an adult. I have a, written a, my own definition of discipline uh, in this context for myself. Okay, You can agree or disagree with this. I would say it's something like this. It's the application of training, because the word rod can mean training, by the way, and instruction. It's the application of training, correction, and consequences that hurts but bears fruit. And it's done out of love, not frustration. I don't know what you think about that statement, but it may be worth thinking about that, praying about that, and seeing what you think. What's your discipline? What's your definition of the kind of discipline that you think God expects adults to bring to children so that they can grow up to be wise and have good character? That works for me. I don't, let me know if it works for you. Now, New Testament. Isn't it interesting that in the whole of the scriptures, I mean, it's a big book, the Bible, right? How many verses do we have of instructions to parents? Almost none. None. There's almost nothing in the Bible directly. Now, isn't that interesting, considering it's so important? One thing it does mean is that whatever we do have must be really important. Because if it's one of the few nuggets, it must be significant. So here we have two very similar uh, instructions in Ephesians and Colossians. Chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. And I must say, I don't think that... That lets mothers off the hook. <laughs> Let me just say that. But fathers, don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That fits a lot, doesn't it, with Deuteronomy and with the Proverbs. Colossians 3, verse 21. Fathers, do not embitter your children. Or they will become discouraged. Nothing, nothing sadder in some ways than a, than a flattened child. You know, a child where the wind and the energy and the zest for life has been taken out of them. And that can happen in life, but well, you know, it's a really sad thing if it's down to a church that's causing that, or a parent. Don't embitter your children. Don't let them become discouraged by our own behavior. Don't exasperate them. Instead, bring them up in that training and instruction uh, of the Lord. It must be said... At least my experience is, um, I find not being exasperated when my children were younger a, a, a very big challenge. Uh, I don't know if it's been your experience as a parent, but it seems to me that children seem to have a hotline to the specific buttons to press that <laughs> exasperate you to the max. It, I don't know what it is, because other adults and other people in my life don't seem to press those buttons quite as regularly. But... I don't, but my son or my daughter just knew exactly what it was. Whether I don't, I hope it wasn't, I don't suppose it was conscious all the time, but they would say things and do things that would just, I, I would feel like there was a volcano about to explode and, and erupt from my head and out of my eyes and just everything. And I, you can't blame children for knowing the buttons. And this is something that adults have got to take responsibility for. We've got to deal with the button pressing in a way that's godly. And in that way, we may grow in Christ. Because it forces us back to dependence on God for the strength to be able to handle that exasperation that we feel so that we don't then pass it on to our children. And those of us who are parents here, um, I'm going to make a guess, but I think I'm probably right. And I did this. Now, one of my resolutions when my first was born was fantastic, what a great gift, wonderful thing, awesome, exciting, everything, wonderful. 
Number one thing I'm going to do, not make the mistakes my parents did. <laughs> That's the number one thing I'm going to do. I know all the mistakes. Well, at least I thought I did. I know all the mistakes my parents made, and I'm not going to do those. And what did I do? I repeated most of them. Yeah. <laughs> at least to the same measure. And sometimes worse. We've got to grow as parents. And adults in this church, if you're not a parent, or your kids aren't here, but there are kids here, it's important that you bear in mind that all of us here have an opportunity or I should say perhaps face the danger of exasperating children in the church. We could, by our behaviour. We could embitter children here. We could discourage children here. And instead, it's so, so important that we learn how to interact with children, whether they are our own children or not, in a way that instead brings them up in the training and instruction of the Lord and make sure that they do not become discouraged in a Christian community. I know I'm not going to talk more about the detail of that right now because there's not time in a lesson like this. But I would strongly urge you to learn what it means. What does it mean to exasperate? What does it mean to embitter? And what, is, what do you think that means for the way that you can interact with children, whether your own or other people's? At the very least, it implies listening to children. And of course, listening requires often asking questions and waiting for the answer and not answering with your own ideas. Listening and nurturing. Listening and caring. Treating children with as much respect as we would like to be treated. Isn't that what Jesus said in general? Treat others as you would wish them to treat you. It's a lot to do with that. Now, a couple of other things. This verse has been misused. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Again, I refer you to my earlier point that Proverbs are not necessarily promises of specifics. They're not always instructions. They are general guidelines uh, in, in, in most of the time. This verse has been used by people, and I probably have done it myself, so I'm not going to point fingers at anybody else. When I was younger, the Christian life and parenting seemed a lot simpler than it does now. Uh, basically, take your children to church, uh, make them read the Bible, pray with them, and they'll automatically pop out as Christians somewhere around the age of 13 to 16. Um, and this verse was often used. If you do the right things when they're young, they will automatically become Christians. But does it have the word Christian in there? Is it in that verse? Hmm. I don't think it is. It's not a promise about children becoming Christians. It's a promise about forming character when children are young. And hopefully spiritual character that will endure. But it needs to be put in its context and understood as to what it is saying and what it is not saying. Because here's the thing in the end. <laughs> we, can't, we can't make any child become a Christian. If you could, it would be the wrong thing to do. Because it would compromise their free will. And all of us sitting here who become Christians became Christians because we chose it. Whether we were younger or older. God does not contest our free will. And he doesn't do that for you and me. And he doesn't do it for our children. There are so few examples in the Old Testament or the New Testament of children following the faith of their parents. Again, isn't that interesting? When you think about the Old Testament, how many children of people of faith wholeheartedly embrace that faith. I mean, it was certainly some. But you think about Eli, whose sons disgraced him. You think about Samuel, whose sons disgraced him. You think about David, King David, a man after God's own heart. You think about where Solomon ended up and so many of his children. It's a sobering thing. And if you're not careful, it, it can lead you to despair. Like if David couldn't manage it, what chance have I got? If Abraham, I mean, some of his kids, I mean... But we need to remember, we need to remember some very important things here. We need to remember that even though we don't have many examples like that, and for example, we don't know how Peter's, the Apostle Peter's children turned out. I mean, he was married, it says he had a wife. So presumably he had kids. We don't know. It's a reminder that, again, there's no formula. And that parenting, like so many things in the Christian life, is messy, not orderly. It is unpredictable in so many ways. 
So you say, well, this is great. There's all despair and there's no hope. So what do we do? Well, let's think about a couple of things. Luke chapter 1. This is uh, a saying about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is going to come, and what is he going to do preparing the way for Jesus? It says he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children. Why pick that? To turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now there are several layers to this, but for the moment at least, let's just take that top layer. He's going to turn the hearts of the parents to their children. Do you know what that implies? It implies that parents' hearts aren't always turned to their children. What are parents' hearts sometimes turned to? Their career, their standing in society, how their parents think they're parenting their children how they think they're doing in other areas of life, how, they, how they're doing with their pension pot, how they're doing with their hobbies and their own recreation. I, lo- I really enjoyed playing football when I was a younger man. I played in that football team I talked about a couple of weeks ago up in Manchester. I loved that, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there were times when I saw that playing football and going training and playing football and hanging out with my football friends in church as a way of escaping my responsibilities as a parent. Do you have escape plans? Escape roots from your responsibility. If Jesus would do anything, if the Spirit of Christ would do anything to us in this church, it would be to turn our hearts to the children. And not just the parents, because we're all aunts and uncles here. Turning our hearts to the children in this church. You know what that means? I'm going to use the word, it means repentance. For some of us it might mean repentance. Repentance. Because that's what John the Baptist was preaching. He was preaching a baptism of repentance. And part of that repentance was turning the hearts of the parents to the children, not neglecting the children. Do you need to repent in some way or other? Secondly, there is hope. What about Philip? Philip the evangelist. They went to Caesarea and stayed at his house. And what was in his house? Four unmarried daughters who prophesied. That's pretty awesome. I mean, you know, imagine if that was your house. You've got four prophesying daughters. I mean, you'd want to let people know about that. You'd put that on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) I haven't got one. I haven't got two. Not even three. I got four. They prophesy, you know. Want to come round? I mean... I, I'm sure that wasn't what Philip was thinking. But I, I'm sure it wasn't what Luke was thinking when he put it in the book of Acts. But isn't it inspiring to know that there were people who had children who followed in the faith? It's not like there weren't very many. There aren't many recorded. It may not be that it wasn't many who followed. It may just be that they didn't want to make a big song and dance out of it in the sense that then there'd be this sense of unworthiness if your children aren't doing that. Or that people would think, well, okay, let me find out how Philip did it. I'm going to go and interview him and write down all the things he and his wife did. And I'm going to turn that into a book. And then I'm going to publish that. And it'll be an Amazon bestseller about how to guarantee your children can prophesy. And that, that would be a temptation. And I'm sure, actually, if someone did that, that book would sell very well. Because we're all anxious. All parents are anxious. And probably even those of us who don't have children in this church right now, we can get a bit anxious. Is What about the next generation? Who's going to be standing here in 10 years? Better not be me. Better be somebody younger. I might not be able to stand up here in 10 years. I don't know. But that's a natural thing. It's a sense of anxiety. And God is, is really is with us. One of the instructions about elders in the New Testament church is that They must manage their family well and see their children obey him, the the elder, doing it in a manner worthy of respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? This implies two things. It implies there will be families in church that don't manage this in some way or other, but they'll still be in the church. And it implies that some do manage this and that do set an example of not necessarily their children becoming Christians at a young age, though that may be the case, but that they have a family that's deserving respect. And I think there are ways to to bring up a family and to bring up a Christian community family with ways that deserve respect. 
And because of that, it's good to learn from those people. They may have learned something that's useful. And having said a lot about there not being formulas, what I would also though add is really important that we talk to one another about our best practices. Some of us understand some things about parenting and raising children and helping children have faith more than others. We've learned, we've been given experiences by God. We need to learn from each other. I would strongly urge us to be in conversation with one another about how to raise children in the Lord, how to help them feel loved and cherished by God. Let's talk about it together. And we won't learn this by just doing what we think is best, what feels good, or what our parents did, or what somebody else told us some time ago, or we were once read in a book. We learn it together. Let's talk about these things. Because with faith, this kind of family can exist. This kind of household can exist. So to wrap up, no formulas, but some principles that I think are very important. As a congregation... And as we talk to our children, it seems to me that Jesus needs to be the hero. Jesus is the hero. I'm not the hero. You're not the hero. At a certain age, at a certain age, uh, the, the children's parents are their heroes, and that's fine. But that does wear off after a while. In the end, it's Jesus must be the hero. He's not just Lord. He's not just Savior. He's not just Judge. He's not just a standard, which I don't like using that word as such. He sets some standards, you could say, but he's, that's not how we relate to Jesus as a standard. We relate to him as our brother, our friend, our saviour, our, I mean, the one who loves us more than anybody else, who gave his life for us. He's our hero. We do what we do in the Christian life because he's amazing. Why would I want to live like anybody else? I must be mad if I want to live like somebody else. Jesus, I want to live like him. And of course, that's a challenge. Let's face it, because living like Jesus means I live less like myself. And I like myself to live the way I like to live a lot of the time because it's convenient and comfortable. But Jesus is the hero. To our children, Jesus must be the hero. What I mean by that is, is Jesus not conformity? Like be quiet at the right time, speak at the right time, eat at the right time, don't eat at the wrong time, uh, read the Bible at this time, pray in this particular way. It's not about the conformity to the outward stuff. It's about the heart for Jesus. And that becomes a challenge for us because we've got to make sure that that's where our heart is too. Which is why our first point in this series is God-focused. Then relationship-based. And then, okay, let's now enable the children to become Christians. It's about that. Jesus is the hero and love is the substance of how we treat our children. Which means being involved with the children. Which means aunts and uncles to our children in this church. Aunts and uncles. Not just mums and dads. You could say children's ministry is everybody's ministry. Certain people will teach classes back in the hall there. That's fine. But children's ministry, ministry to serving children is the responsibility of everybody in the congregation. Getting to know the names of the children. Getting to know their likes and dislikes. Getting to know them as people. Not just as small things running around. I confess, I find that hard. But it's important. And for us parents who are worried about all these things and don't want to be public about things, I'd just say don't, don't hide away until your children leave home thinking you'll have everything under control back home. Don't hide away. We need each other. It's about Jesus as the hero. It's about love as the substance of our connections. And it's about God. It's about being God-focused. It's about praying about and for all the children in the church and about looking at scriptures to educate ourselves as to how to treat the children in the way that Jesus would treat them. So, anxiety is a challenge. But we don't have to give in to anxiety. Once we release the children from our control, because we can't control their destiny, the goal is to be what someone once said is a good enough parent or a good enough community, church, aunts and uncles. Good enough. As Christ-like as we can be. The only thing that you and I can control is our own behaviour. Not that, ultimately, of our children's belief system. Another way to state it might be to say that, as a church, it's important for us to have a clear conscience before God as to how we interact with the children. 